Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'm Chris Sable, Executive Director for the Vail Symposium. So on behalf of Dale Mosier, our board chair and the entire Vail Symposium board, thank you for joining us. The Vail Symposium has been offering thought-provoking, uh, affordable programming for our community since 1971. I'd like to thank the organizations and the individuals who helped make the Vail Symposium and all of our programming possible. Our presenting sponsors are the Town of Vail and the Frechette Family Foundation. Our event sponsors are Vail Resorts Epic Promise, the Vail Daily, and the Antlers at Vail. Our summer season is underwritten by Cindy Ingalls, and tonight's program is underwritten by Lainey and Merv Lappin and Jennifer and Flip Merritts. Tickets cover less than 15% of the cost to run the Vail Symposium, so donations at any size make a difference. Let's give all of our donors a round of applause. I believe tonight is the halfway point of our summer-fall season, which means we still have at least 10 programs to go. So if you haven't been paying attention, if you're not on our website, go there, sign up for our weekly newsletters, but you can find out all of the great programs that we have coming up. Our next program is on Wednesday, September 14th. It'll be at the Donovan Pavilion, and the program is called Pull the Plug on Stress, Tools to Adapt and Thrive During Uncertain Times. I'm going to just read a little bit about the program to hopefully wet your whistle. How do we adapt and even thrive during such unpredictable, crazy times? While the severity of the pandemic seems to have diminished significantly, a host of other existential threats waits in the wings to grab the headlines and our vitality. But there's actually hope, scientifically validated hope, in the form of a set of tools pioneered by a California research organization. Bruce Cryer was one of the original creators of HeartMath, a system of scientifically validated tools, techniques, and behaviors to reduce stress, enhance performance, amplify creativity, and improve overall well-being. Does anybody need that? <laughs> I think most of us would say we could use some of that. Cryer was on the faculty at Stanford University for 25 years and the lead author of the landmark Harvard Business Review article, Pull the Plug on Stress. And if you want to learn more or take a deeper dive, the next day he'll lead two workshops, Up Your Game, The Practical Science and Tools of Heart Math for Well-Being, Resiliency, and Vitality, and the second workshop, Unleashing Creativity, Five Catalysts to Activate Your Creative Power for Business, Health, Relationships, and Youthing. Look around. <laughs> So I hope you'll take a look at that. I think it will be a, a, an exceptional program. Tonight, we have a bipartisan discussion on the state of American politics at home and abroad. We've got a distinguished group of speakers. To lead this discussion is our moderator, Chris Whipple. Chris is an author, documentary filmmaker, and speaker. He's been called an indispensable observer of American power. A former producer for CBS 60 Minutes, He's the author of the upcoming book, The Fight of His Life Inside Joe Biden's White House. He also wrote the critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller, The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Divine Every Presidency. And we'll see a little bit more about that tonight in the program. He also wrote The Spy Masters, How CIA Directors Shape the History and Future. Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent of the New York Times calls him a premier journalist and historian of the White House, as well as the intelligence community. community. He'll be joined by former Chiefs of Staff Jack Watson and Andy Card. He'll introduce them. Please give a warm welcome to our speakers. <clears throat> Can everybody hear okay? Wow, what a, what a turnout. Um, thank you, Chris, for that really generous introduction. Um, you know, it's, it's really a privilege to be here in such a spectacular place. Uh, and we've already met some amazing and interesting and engaging people since we've been here. Um, but thanks to you, Chris, and to Rebecca Zweig for making this event possible. 
I'm really pleased to be here with my friends Jack Watson and Andy Card, two of the great White House Chiefs of Staff in modern history. Uh, when I wrote my first book, The Gatekeepers, back in 2017, I never dreamed that it would launch me on a, on a career uh, as a political analyst. Uh, but uh, one of the best things about it, by far, has been becoming friends with Jack and Andy, their wives, uh, Beth and Kathleen. Uh, so that's really been a, a pleasure. Um, I really couldn't have done my new book on Joe Biden, which comes out in January, without, uh, without these guys and their help, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, Andy Card was the Cal Ripken of White House Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> he served George W. Bush's, as George W. Bush's confidant and top advisor for just over five years, a record that everyone agrees will never be broken. Ron Klain, the current chief of staff, I can tell you, is in awe of Andy and, ha and, and can't figure out how he lasted so long. Um, but anyway, Andy wanted to be the chief of staff whose name nobody knew. Uh, but that ended on the morning of September 11th uh, when in a Florida elementary school classroom he whispered in the president's ear, the second tower has been struck, America is under attack. So Andy became a wartime chief of staff, and I can tell you in a White House full of heavyweight personalities jockeying for power, he, he was beloved by everyone he worked with. Jack Watson was one of Jimmy Carter's top advisors. He served as assistant to the president for intergovernmental inter affairs and secretary of the cabinet before becoming Carter's chief during his last eight months as president. And in my humble opinion, Jimmy Carter's biggest mistake as president was failing to make Jack his chief of staff on day one. Things might have gone a whole lot better with Jack steering his agenda. Uh, he's a Phi Beta Kappa Harvard Law School graduate and former Marine. Uh, maybe Marines are never former <laughs> Marine. <laughs> Who was so competent, organized, and polished that one White House staffer joked, that he thought Jack had been injected with a perfect serum. <laughs> oh, In any event, they are two of America's finest public servants. And, and by the way, I do mean servants. One of my favorite stories involves the time Andy, who was then the sitting White House Chief of Staff, met the actor John Spencer, who played Leo McGarry on the television series The West Wing. Some of you may remember. After they were introduced, Spencer looked at Card and said, how much do you make? <laughs> so Carr told him, Spencer looked at him again and said, is that per episode? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet, the White House Chief of Staff, despite the pay, is the most grueling, demanding, relentless, thankless, and maybe consequential job in government. Uh, it was Jack who coined the term that stuck for the White House Chiefs. He called them the javelin catchers. Uh, before The Gatekeepers was a book, uh, it was a documentary film, and if I, I want to play for you a brief clip from that film to show you what Jack meant by that. So, uh, Jeff, if we could play clip number four. Roll it. When Democrat Bill Daley was appointed as Obama's chief, he called former Republican chief James Baker for advice. When he uh, answered the phone, he said, congratulations, you have the worst blanking job in America. White House chief of staff usually walks around with, uh, with a target painted on his back and on his front. Those aren't the only parts. And that's what I mean by it being the worst uh, job in government. Your job really is to just catch the javelins that are t intended for the old man. The javelins come not just from the president's political enemies, but from friends, too. Angry about real or imagined betrayals. You are, in effect, a heat shield for the president. When anybody gives you advice about, oh, you should do this, you should do that, unless they've sat in that cockpit seat and been strafed by friendly fire as well as enemy fire, they don't know anything about the job. And when a crisis strikes, the chief is at the center of the storm. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords has been shot. In Lebanon now is 161 Americans dead. Certainly the largest financial disaster in decades. Oh, another one just hit. 
I walked up to the president and whispered into his right ear, America is under attack. Major parts of the federal government are due to shut down this morning. Apartment complex called Watergate. You have very few days when you know exactly what's going to happen. The president is shot, and you're, you're wondering, is this the end? The serviceman is being held hostage. And the price of natural gas. Machinery that pumps money into the federal government stopped, caught in a political battle. Bill Clinton at that point had drawn a line. Americans remain hostages in Tehran tonight. There was a constant, unending drumbeat. We had real live intel on a terrorist event at the inaugural. I thought that the conflict was going worse than anybody was willing to acknowledge. Tonight, he was rolling the dice on the presidency. In my opinion, we have averted World War III. The modern record for longevity is five years. The average chief lasts a little more than a year and a half. The White House Chief of Staff, I think, is the toughest, most uh, pressure-packed job that one can have. I was 29 years old. I felt 59. Is it miserable going through it? Are you getting the wind shear, frostbitten, all alone? Can't tell up from down, wind is knocking you. Yeah. Would you trade it in and not have done it? And, he'll, and I guarantee to, the third, to the, every chief of staff you asked, they said I would do it again if asked. So on that note, um, I guess I'd like to put the first question to Andy. Would, would you do it all over again? And, and to find the job for us. First of all, you do not apply to be the president's chief of staff. I don't know anyone who applied to be chief of staff who became chief of staff. And the president does not go to monster.com or Indeed looking for a chief of staff. So I was shocked when I was asked to be the president's chief of staff. I actually thought he was asking me to be in charge of his transition into government. I had been in charge of the president's departure from government, his dad. So I thought that I was being asked to be a transition leader. But he turns out he was asking me to be his chief of staff. The job is all consuming. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're responsible, and I'm <clears throat> taking this from a professor at Harvard named Roger B. Porter, who worked for many presidents and wrote a book about organizations. And basically, he said that the chief of staff's job is number one, the care and feeding of the president. You should all want to be president. You're very well cared for, and you're very well fed. But that means you have to pay attention to the president's abilities to do the job 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because it might, tough decision might come at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, or 6 a.m. on a holiday, and he's got to be ready or she's got to be ready. The second part of the job is policy formulation, and that's what all of you think the job is primarily about. I view that responsibility as really managing the personalities of those around the president who he has hired, who by definition are the best and the brightest in their field. Which means they have big egos. <laughs> and the chief of staff job is to manage those egos and make sure the president doesn't get bullied into a decision or have a decision made for him that is constitutionally his decision to make. So, yes, it's policy. I got very involved in policy but it's really managing the personalities around the president that advise him on policy and making sure that there is not monolithic thinking in the White House. Democracy should not be so easy that it's easy to make a decision <coughs> about if you're president. Presidents should make only the toughest of decisions. They should not make every government decision. They should make presidential decisions, not government decisions. And they should be responsible for the decisions they make which means that they have to be presented lots of options and not only discuss how things will be implemented to live up to expectations, but to try to anticipate unintended consequences in the process. So managing that is a huge part of the president's chief of staff's job. And when you're dealing with strong personalities like Dick Cheney, Don Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, yeah, it's a challenge. 
The final thing is from Roger Porter, marketing and selling. The chief of staff's job is to take the president's decisions and make sure they're implemented to live up to his or her expectations. And if a president makes a decision and nobody knows about it, did the president make a decision? And the truth is no. But they'd be given the burden to make a decision and they would come in and I would greet the president optimistically every morning. What a privilege it was to say, top of the morning, Mr. President. It's a great day. No matter how miserable it was outside, it was a great day. Because I wanted him to come to work as an optimist, not a pessimist. No one wants to follow a leader who says, follow me and things will get worse. <laughs> so I was always an optimist. And I told him I was very proud of him, I was glad he was president, and you're going to have some great decisions to make today. But when he made the decisions, he would tell me what the decision was at that early morning, welcome to the Oval Office. And he was done with it. I made the decision. I had to communicate the decision to the White House staff, who by definition should not always agree with it. I had to help tell members of Congress, who by definition don't want to agree with it how to tell UN ambassadors, or prime ministers, or popes, or queens, or kings. So that's the marketing and selling. And the key chief of staff's job is to coordinate all of that, but it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it is all consuming, and I felt very privileged to do it. To answer your question, I believe if a president asks you to do something, you should try to talk him or her out of it, but if they don't, change their mind, say yes. <clears throat> Jack, um, thanks Andy. T t talk a little bit about what, what that was like with Jimmy Carter, being chief of staff with Jimmy Carter, but also if you could bring it up to the present. Um, Andy, Andy, of course, was the, as I said before, the, the chief uh, whose name he didn't want anybody to know. And someone once said that, that a White House staffer should have a passion for anonymity. And I think Ron Klain, to some extent, may fit that mold, unlike some other chiefs. But anyway, that's a three-part question, but it's, the, the floor is yours. I'm not sure what the three parts are. <laughs> <laughs> Neither am I. I. I agree with what Andy has described. One of the main roles of the White House Chief of Staff is to be an honest broker, by which we mean he or she is the person who is charged with ensuring that the president is hearing all the voices he, he needs to hear. He's reading all the things he needs to read, not the things he doesn't need to read or the voices he doesn't need to hear. So there's judgment always as to what the honest broker's role actually manifests as. I, I was reluctant during the discussions with others to state my own opinion in the presence of everybody. I would typically, and White House chiefs will vary on this. Generally speaking, after, after the president heard everything I thought he needed to hear, read everything I thought he needed to read, I would then be with him and try to guide him a little bit as to what this person's bias might be or this person's personal interest might be. We're flying a serpentine way waiting for fighter jets to come up and protect us. And the whole time, the president is telling me we're going back to Washington. The Secret Service is telling me we can't go back there until we know much more about what's happening. You know, president Bush was adamant. Uh, he even used terms like, I am the President of the United States. And I was trying to be cool, calm, and objective. And I had the Secret Service very firm with me. I had the President of the United States very firm with me. And I just said, Mr. President, I, I really can't recommend that. We have to know more about the nature of the attacks and if others are coming. He was firm with me, and yes, he was yelling at me. He was yelling at me, and I just said, I really can't recommend that. Thank you. 
Well, a as we know, ultimately George W. Bush did listen to Andy Card, uh, and Air Force One crisscrossed the country that day before ultimately returning to Washington. Um, Andy, the 9-11 attacks effectively turned George W. Bush into a wartime president. Uh, and it seems to me that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has turned Joe Biden into a wartime president. Um, tell us how you think George Bush and Joe Biden have met that moment. September 11, 2001 was a day that we all promised never to forget. And many of us have moved on, but the truth is we should never forget it. And there were a lot of people who died that day that just went to work. A lot of <clears throat> others died because they did go to work to rescue other people. There were a lot of people who died because they answered the call to duty because of what happened to that day. And we have an obligation not to forget it. When George W. Bush took the oath of office to be president, remember, he was picked by the Supreme Court. And he was derided. There were some members of Congress who refused to call him president. And he took an oath of office. And after that oath of office, he gave a speech, his inaugural address. He didn't mention anything about going to war. He had an agenda. He was passionate about it, but it was a domestic agenda, an economic agenda. It was a compassionate agenda. It wasn't even much of a foreign policy agenda. On September 11, 2001 in Sarasota, Florida, after waking up to a glorious day, September 11, 2001 was a perfect day in the lower 48. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And the president woke up and he was nervous about going for a jog on the golf course because he invited a reporter, Stretch Kyle, to go running with him, which was not unusual, except that he found out Stretch Kyle had been an NCAA All-American cross-country runner. <laughs> and the Bushes were unbelievably competitive. They didn't let the grandkids win at checkers, you know, that type of thing. So he was very preoccupied with this run on the golf course with Stretch Kyle. He's getting ready to go out for the run. I said, have a good run, it'll be great. And it's an easy day. You're gonna be talking about your most passionate interest, which is leaving no child behind in education. You go into an elementary school, you're gonna be meeting with teachers, a community, and students. When you get back from the run, we'll have a CIA briefing, then we'll go over to the school. He went off for the run. He came back, he had the George W. Bush strut. You've seen it. He beat Stretch Kyle. <laughs> and he was full of himself, felt very good. As we loaded into the motorcade to go over to the Emma E. Booker School in Sarasota, Florida, an elementary school, I did hear two people ask if anybody had heard about a plane crash in New York City. One was Kyle Rove, the other one was Dan Bartlett. We got into the limousines, we drove over to the M.E. Booker School, the president went to a phone and talked to his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice. I went into the classroom where the president was going to be, and I saw the second grade students lined up in perfect form, very well behaved, with a, a teacher who was very well groomed, very attentive to detail, and very caring for those kids. And I saw the press pool gathering and dressed slovenly, kind of <laughs> bumping around. And I walked into the classroom to see if it was ready, and I looked at the classroom over it. I saw a misspelled word on a bulletin board, and I said, get a book cover and cover that up. I don't want a Dan Quayle potato moment. <laughs> I then went back into the holding room, and I'm standing at the door with the President of the United States and the principal of the school when a Navy captain, who was the director of the White House Situation Room, came up and said to the president, Sir, it appears a small twin-engine prop plane crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center in New York City. The president, the principal, and I all had the same reaction. <clears throat> oh, what a horrible accident. The pilot must have had a heart attack or something. The principal then opened the door to the classroom, and she and the president went into the classroom. The door shut. I'm standing there. Captain Lauer, 
Deb Lauer came up to me and said, sir, it appears it was not a small twin engine prop plane, it was a commercial jetliner. My mind flashed to the fear that the passengers on the plane must have had, they had to know it was losing altitude. I don't know why that's where my mind went, but that was where it went. But that was only a nanosecond because Captain Lauer then came up to me and said, oh my God, another plane hit the other tower at the World Trade Center. My mind then flashed to three initials, UBL, Osama bin Laden. I knew about Al-Qaeda, I knew Osama bin Laden, I knew he was a bad guy. Andy, let me interrupt. My next, my next, problem, from, my next problem was, do I tell the president? We get that all the time. Yes, I have to tell the president. Chiefs of staff get that burden all day long. I, this president needs to know this. This one was, yes, the president needs to know it. I walked in, I thought about what I would say. I told him a second plane hit the second tower, America's under attack. I was very impressed with how he reacted. He did nothing to scare those kids. He did nothing to demonstrate fear to the media that would have translated it to the satisfaction of the terrorists. And he also, I believe, recognized for the first time what the real job of being president was. He and thought he, about his oath. So that's the burden, and that's when the president became president. Yep. Andy, you, <coughs> Chris is going to kill us if we spend the whole hour talking about 9-11, but um, it, it, any, any thoughts about, any overarching thoughts about how George W. Bush met that challenge uh, versus Joe Biden? Yes, I'll say that yeah. there was a difference. George W. Bush addressed an attack on America. President Biden addressed an attack on a democracy. Very different. One was truly an obligation because the Constitution requires the president to take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States was not threatened by what Putin did in Ukraine. But President Biden became a wartime president. And I'm sure the national security team was doing everything they could to make sure that it wouldn't result in an attack on America. So very different obligations, <clears throat> different burdens. And I think President Biden stepped up to meet that <clears throat> responsibility after having stumbled candidly about withdrawing from Afghanistan. But he stepped up in terms of helping to protect the democracy that we had kind of promised to help protect. So I give him high marks for that. But it's, it's really not apples to apples saying George W. Bush responding to an attack on America and President Biden responding to attack on democracy that we respect and kind of implied that we would protect. Yeah. Jack, on your watch, the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Uh, and most people think about the, the, the Mujahideen and the CIA covert operation that drove the Soviets out as being something that Ronald Reagan started. Actually, Carter started it. Uh, yes. Any lessons uh, for Biden and Ukraine uh, from, from that experience? And, and just generally, how do you think Joe Biden has met this moment with you? <clears throat> Answer the second one first. I think he's done extraordinarily well, President Biden. He stepped into an international situation, and specifically the NATO situation, which had been weakened over years and threatened with obsolescence by some over the years. And he rallied them as only the President of the United States can do and the experience that Joe Biden had, the decades of experience as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, his relationships with European leaders, his familiarity with the processes by which and through which the European leaders would marshal their assets and their defenses and their weapons and their equipment in support of the Ukrainians and the Ukrainian government. I think the president did that extraordinarily well. Afghanistan. The Soviets invaded Afghanistan on Christmas Eve, 1979. President Carter immediately ended our diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. He, with, he 
withdrew. He recalled the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, Ambassador Thomas J. Watson of the IBM Corporation. He subsequently boycotted the Olympics, which were being hosted by the Soviets in Moscow, a controversial decision, but one that hurt Moscow and the Soviets considerably. And to your point, Chris, he had started in the early part of 1979 to authorize, he had authorized, in fact, the beginning of a CIA operation, which was called Operation Cyclone. Cyclone. And under that authorization, the CIA was authorized to begin monies going to the Afghanis and the, the, the Mujahideen specifically for training, for training and so forth. It was all non-lethal. It was all non-lethal assistance. When the Soviets hit Afghanistan, that was expanded into what became a $20 billion appropriation over time for the assistance of the Mujahideen. It took nine years for the Afghans to expel the Soviets and President Reagan continued what Carter had started. He continued the, the, the support unstintingly and it, it turned out as we hoped it would. Back to President Biden, as hard as it is to sustain national support for a war in another part of the world, in this case against the Ukrainians, it is my personal opinion that the president will do that. President Biden will do everything in his power to sustain that support, to keep the American people informed of why that support is essential. Because I believe that ultimately Ukraine has to prevail. How you define the prevailing will be an interesting and challenging issue, but we cannot withdraw our support. Andy, you were with George W. Bush on several occasions when he met with Vladimir Putin, and I think you have a great backstory about the time when George W. Bush said that he looked into his eyes and got a sense of his soul, right? Yes. Tell us, tell us about that. Well, George, President George W. Bush met with President Putin about 40 times during his presidency, which is an, an awful lot. Uh, <clears throat> the very first meeting took place in Slovenia. It was June of 2001, and I was privileged to go on the trip. I was even more privileged to watch how the president prepared for that trip. And contrary to the myth, he does read. <laughs> and. He is a very, very good student and does his homework <clears throat> and really did more work than was assigned. On his own, he read a history of the Russian Empire. On his own, he read a biography of Putin. And yes, he read all of the information that came in from the CIA, the Commerce Department, the Defense Department, the Trade Representative's Office, and everybody else. And he was very well prepared. But I could tell that he was nervous about meeting with President Putin on that first trip. As we were flying to Slovenia, <clears throat> the president was in his office on Air Force One, and he was studying his paperwork, and a little bit more than normal, even. And I watched as he was kind of practicing what he would do and how we re would react. And I could tell he was nervous. We landed and went to Slovenia, and it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in the world. It was just a spectacular venue. And we arrived, and the Russians were the hosts, even though it was in Slovenia. And it was arranged for President Putin and President Bush to take a little bit of a walk in the woods and have the cameras take pictures of them walking in the woods. And it was funny, when President Putin came up to President Bush, he spoke English. And President Bush responded, it's so much better than my Russian. <laughs> and the president was touched that, he tried to, that President Putin tried to speak English. And they went off of their walk in the woods. Obviously, I didn't accompany them, so I don't know what they talked about. They may have talked about nothing. They came back, and 
then went into a building and Condoleezza Rice and I were there and our counterparts were there. And the president was sitting next to President Putin, but the translator for Putin was in between them and the president's translator was to his left. And the press came in and took pictures of the two presidents shaking hands and then they left. And President Putin then reached into his satchel and pulled out a stack of cards, five by six cards, uh, which is very Russian, and put them in front of him and started to welcome the president to Slovenia and to the meeting. And the president reached over and put his hand on top of President Putin's stack of cards and President Putin winced and moved back. And the president said, you'll have a chance to go through every single card. We'll stay here as long as it takes. I'll be fully attentive. But before we get started, can I ask you a question? And the chancellor goes, blah, 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 And President Putin is kind of taken aback. And then the pre President Putin says, yes. And President Bush says, what was it like when the dacha that you loved to go to with your mother burned to the ground and you went there for the first time and you were brushing through the ashes and something gold glistened. And President Putin went back and said, that was the most amazing experience. And his translator translates it. That home was where all of my memories were. It was, I love to be there. And I'm going through the ashes and I see the gold glistening. And it was the cross my mother gave me. And President Bush said, that's the power of the cross and the power of faith. As it turned the out, whole meeting then changed. <clears throat> they went through every card. At the end of the meeting, they shook hands, and the meeting went on about 30 minutes longer than it had been scheduled. The press was waiting for the two leaders to come out. They took the stage, and yes, a New York Times reporter said, Mr. President, you sat with President Putin. Uh, you looked into your eyes, and what did you see? And I could, I could see his soul. He got hammered for that. He got hammered. But I know from whence it came, and I believe it was sincere. I was privileged to be with President Bush most other times he met with President Putin. That relationship soured. It started to sour slowly and slowly and slowly. Eventually, when Russia went into Georgia, it severed. But yes, that first visit made a difference, and they actually had a very constructive number of meetings for the first probably three years of the presidency of President <clears throat> George W. Bush. Thanks, Andy. Uh, let me pose a question to both of you, starting with Jack, and try to bring this forward to present day. Um, and that is, tell me if you agree with, it seems to me that Joe Biden and, and his team came into office facing the most daunting array of challenges since FDR. Uh, the pandemic, an economy that had collapsed, the aftermath of an insurrection uh, that almost ended our democracy, um, only then to be hit by a, an almost perfect storm of crises from the supply chain problems to raging inflation. Uh, the pandemic came back in the form of Delta, the, the Delta variant. Um, how would you guys grade Joe Biden and Ron Klain and their team on facing these challenges? I'd give them a high grade, actually, because I was very, <laughs> I'm very empathetic with what they were facing. When we, in 1979, in November of 1979, I'm sure no one will remember, hostages were taken <laughs> and by the Iranians, 54 American hostages. And that was an ongoing, unrelenting, ever-present challenge that the president, President Carter, dealt with every day in a very personal way. 
we, we took enormous steps to shut their international economy and economic connections with the whole world down very effectively. Then, in, then on Christmas Eve, 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. Beginning in about December, January of 1980, the Iranians, because of everything that was going on in the country, the Iranian Revolution and all the rest of it, their, their daily production of oil dropped 4.8 million barrels a day. And that had a, a huge impact on the international market, petroleum import market. Gas prices in the United States, imported petroleum prices, first doubled, then quadrupled. And at the pump, we were, in, we were experiencing in this country 10% increases in the price of gasoline per month. Per month. That was leading to recession. Interest rates went to 20%. Then in April of 1980, the Mariel boat lift occurred and a hundred, over a period of just a few months, 125,000 Cubans came across the Florida Strait into Florida, into South Florida, and had to be dealt with by our government. So I can relate to a lot of things going on at once. Uh, President Biden and Ron Klain, and let me say a word, just a word about Ron Klain. I don't think anybody has ever gone into the chief of staff's job any better prepared by experience than Ron Klain. Number one, he knew the, president, the vice president as his chief of staff, Vice President Biden. He had worked with him on the Hill in the Senate. He knew him well, Biden knew him well, the trust between the two led them to be able virtually to complete each other's sentences. And, and that relationship between the chief of staff and the president doesn't exist every time. We won't go into other examples where it didn't exist very well, but Ron's, Ron's relationship was near perfect as was his experience. So my answer to your question is I think they, they did well, are continuing to do well, with, a, with the barest, the thinnest margins in the House and Senate, in the Senate, of course, 50-50, <clears throat> they've gotten an, an enormous amount of legislation passed, and we can perhaps talk about that some other yeah, time. Yeah, and I was going to say, and maybe Andy, you can pick it up from there, obviously, give us your, your impression, um, but also, it it seems that in the last six weeks, an awful lot has changed. Uh, and <clears throat> Joe Biden initially vowed, as we all remember, that he would bring bipartisan, bipartisanship back. A lot of people thought he was smoking something, that that would never happen. And lo and behold, after a long struggle at the, at the outset, we've had a, a real string of bipartisan successes ranging from uh, you know, in, bipartisan infrastructure to the Gun Control Act to, uh, or Gun Safety Act to uh, the CHIPS Act and Veterans Health Care and a few others. Um, so is bipartisanship alive and well? No. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do think that progress is being made. Uh, I, I did not give President Biden high marks in the first few weeks of his presidency. I, the first I felt few weeks? First few weeks. Yeah. I did not give him high marks. And I also, I did give Ron Klain high marks. And it's not just a chief of staff thing. I thought, I pay attention to what the chief of staff does and respect the burden every one of them carries, even if I may not agree with the, the burden that they do carry. Uh, but I respect that, and so it's not unusual for me to pay attention and to offer a compliment if I see something going well. I almost never call and say, I don't like what you're doing, because that's not up to me. Uh, but President Biden, I think I did, raised expectations, was not able to meet them in the early days of his presidency, the early weeks of the presidency. 
It was also very clouded by the reality of what had happened on January 6th. And that caused, I'm going to say, a, a real challenge in being able to message your message to members of Congress and to constituencies that pay attention to what they do. So I did not give him high marks. Um, I do think that he was dealt some pretty tough cards. The, the hand he was dealt was not the one that he anticipated getting. And I don't think he always played that hand as well as he could have. I was critical of his speech in Atlanta. I thought it was not as inclusive as it could have been. And Chris and I actually this was talked a speech, about This was a speech about voting rights. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, uh, but, look at that. When I got involved in politics, the rug of American politics had more rug than fringe. Today it has more fringe than rug. I'm a, I'm a, I stand on the rug, and I invite others to stand on the rug, and I think we've got to learn how to talk to each other, acknowledge more common ground than we're willing to acknowledge, and work to find solutions. I think President Biden benefited by having a senator from West Virginia who said, I want to find my way to the rug. You're, you're forcing me to stand on the fringe. Give me a chance to step on the rug. And I think that's been a good thing. So, and guess what? President Biden is my president. He's your president. I don't want the president to fail. Oh, See, I'm and that's yeah. where I am. So <clears throat> I am, I'm, I don't agree with a lot of the things that he wants to do. I disagree with some of the things that he did do, but I don't want him to fail in his responsibility to recognize he is president of everyone in this country, not just the people who voted for him or not just the people who support him. He's the president of everybody, and I'm going to rally others around to create a climate of success for our democracy. I was the chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy, started by President Ronald Reagan 35 years ago. I was not president for 35 years, I was president for two years, or maybe three years, and that <coughs> responsibility is to polish, you know, plant seeds of democracy around the world and polish democracy. Our democracy is tarnished right now, please polish it. <coughs> we the people are the polishers, it's our government. Leaders don't tarnish us if we have the polishing cloth in our hand and are ready to clean up their mess and help them do it. Jack, <clears throat> same, same question to you. I, I made some notes when I was thinking about coming to talk with you all on this bipartisan point. I agree with Andy that we, we are not in good shape on bipartisan action with respect to so many of the big issues, healthcare and immigration and the economy. Uh, we, we need to do a lot better. The deep divisions in the country are killing us. And in many respects, they're making us ungovernable. And, and I say that with dismay. On the other side of the coin, the Infrastructure Act, speaking to his bipartisan approach, uh, was a bipartisan passed bill. 19 Republican senators voted for it. That was the, the infrastructure act that he had promised to pass when, when he was campaigning for the presidency. The Inflation Reduction Act, on the other hand, didn't get a single Republican vote, either in the House or in the Senate. The American Rescue Plan, which was the first thing he did, the $1.9 trillion to help people get through the pandemic, the governments get through the pandemic, etc. No Republican votes in either House or Senate. But the PACT Act, the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxic Act, that was the Veterans Health Care Act, that had substantial Republican support, 86 votes in the Senate. That's 36 Republican senators voting with the President on that act. The Chips and Science Act, in, in 1990, about 37 percent of all the microchips were produced in the United States. Today, less than 12 percent 
are produced. All the chips are coming from Taiwan and China. It's very dangerous. We passed, the, we, the people, Biden, passed a $54 billion Chips and Science Act to fund the modernization and building of industrial capacity in this country to create microchips. That's great. And what that's already done in response from the private sector is 150 additional billion dollars pledged to match it. That's huge. The Federal Gun Safety Act also had substantial support from, from both House and Senate Republicans. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah. <clears throat> but you know what? In making our, in making our opinions, our political opinions, deciding what we're going to be for and what we're going to be against, whom we're going to criticize and whom we're going to support. Pay it, we have to pay attention to the facts. We really do. Senator Patrick Moynihan of New York many years ago said a much quoted statement that everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. And in a democracy, I don't mean to sound preachy here, but in a democracy where the people are deciding which paths to take, which policies to support, what to do about immigration, what to do about health care, what to do about families with dependent children, we have to pay attention to what the facts are. We'll disagree, we'll debate, We'll discuss, and then we'll compromise. Friends, compromise is not a dirty word. That's what politics is all about. And for too many years now, we've not been compromising. We need to do better. I hate to even attempt to follow that, but uh, let me just say before we throw this to questions, that um, it, it, it has seemed to me that in spending the last year and a half writing my book on Joe Biden's White House, that there's a kind of contradiction at the heart of Biden's presidency, and, and you, you both touched on it. Um, on the one hand, Biden was determined to unify the country, uh, and I think still is, and, and still believes against all the odds that he can. And on the other hand, he was compelled to call out the big lie of the stolen 2020 election and all of the misinformation that goes along with it. Um, <clears throat> so it, it seems to me, I'm not gonna ask you guys to answer this right now uh, because we wanna open it up, but it seems to me that that's something that Biden resisted for the first year of his presidency, was the idea that, uh, of going, attacking Trump. He called him the former guy. He didn't want to go there, but it seems to me now he has gone there. Um, <clears throat> I thought the January 6th anniversary speech, and Leon Panetta also agrees with me, that that was a great speech. That was a speech that could, that could maybe even turn around a presence. He compared it to Bill Clinton's speech at Oklahoma City. I'm not sure it was that significant, but I think it was terrific, and I think that Joe Biden's going to continue to struggle with these, the, this tension between those two things. Should we take questions? Be, before we do, can we just take a few minutes and talk about what's going on now, the midterms, the state of the two parties, and where we are? I figured that would probably be the first question from the audience. It, but it is. Yes, let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about the midterms. It, it, it seems to me that... Um, a couple of months ago, it was a bleak picture by all accounts for the Democrats, uh, particularly in the House, but, but even in the Senate. And things have changed, yes or no? I think, thing, I think things have changed a bit. I, I, think that, uh, I think that the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade has awakened a lot of people in the country. And I think the, what's happening and what's happened since that United States Supreme Court decision what's happened in the state by state by state. The practical application of that decision is opening a lot of people's eyes. And I think that's going to be a factor 
in the midterm elections. How big a factor? No one knows. But it will be a factor. And, and it should be. It should be a factor. Uh, I think it's looking a lot better for the Senate, for the Democrats. Did I tell you I'm a Democrat? <laughs> it's looking better for the Democrats, but everything is close. Every race is close. One of the sad and to me most dismaying things about American politics in our time, yours and mine, is how much it costs. We're talking about, and listen when I say this, we're talking about in these races, midterm races, spending billions of dollars. That's with a B. To say nothing of the 24 presidential election coming up just two years later. So let me just stop with this statement. What happens in these midterms is hugely important. Pay attention. Vote. Get your friends to vote. And I'm saying that to you Republicans, and I'm saying that to you Democrats. Go to the polls and vote. Be engaged. That's what the, that's what the democracy is all about. Historically, the incumbent president's party in the midterm elections gets slammed. That's the historic tradition. We'll see whether or not that happens this time. And I, I, six weeks ago, I would have said the economy is going to drive the result, and the economy is not doing well. Republicans will gain control of the House relatively easily, and they have a decent chance of regaining control of the Senate. Today, I would say both have eroded. The opportunity for success has eroded on the Republican side. And, and it's not because of the economy, and it's not because of, I'm going to say, every bill that was passed. It's because the dialogue has been poisoned so that most people don't pay attention to the dialogue. And we become, the Republican Party has become a party of personality rather than policy. And it's a party of passion rather than a party of profound difference in policy. We are, I think, in trouble. There were seven, seven states that will make the difference and define the Senate. And I, I do agree with majority, I mean, minority leader George, I mean, I, I, McConnell is, he's telling the truth. We didn't get the best candidates to run for some of those positions. Candidates make a difference. How they perform as candidates makes a position, a, a difference. And so Mitch McConnell was right in saying that we didn't get the best candidates. And th those seven states are where those candidates are. And so it's gonna be a real <coughs> challenge to control the Senate. I do think the Republicans will marginally control the House because of reapportionment and redistricting, primarily. And, uh, how strident candidates have been in primaries. Uh, the, the first primary was held just this week in the whole season. It was a Massachusetts primary. Republicans and Democrats went to the polls. And in Massachusetts is a very Democrat state. More Democrats showed up to vote than Republicans. The Republicans nominated a candidate that I think will have a very hard time winning the governorship of Massachusetts. I have empathy for him because he was a state representative to the same district I represented in Massachusetts and I ran for governor and it was a forgettable campaign and I lost. <laughs> but that changed my life because I got a call from Jim Baker who invited me to come to work to Washington DC, so it changed my life. But no, the, the season has started. The most important word in the Constitution I told you was the first word, we. Yes, he's right. We have to vote. We, Republicans should vote, Democrats should vote, Independents should vote, and others who don't know what they are should find out how to become something that they can be a difference in our government. That's the strength of democracy. We are a republic, we're not a direct democracy. The republic part of our responsibility is what we do by going to the polls. 
Who do we want to represent us? It isn't who do we want to represent me or you. <clears throat> who do you want to represent all of us? Maybe pay attention to me when I call you, but don't follow my advice blindly. And I'm gonna, this is, we have many people in America that are stuck on stupid right now. <laughs> because we, we wake up, we've always woken up in, in a democracy with our own ideas. The president does know what he's doing. I could do a better job. Am I state rep? Am I state senator? Am I congressman? Am I senator? We wake up with that. It, it, we, we love political discussions. I grew up in a family of political discussions all the time. It was great. I could say I was right, it, it, and people would say maybe I was. My grandmother would always say, you don't know what you're talking about. Go do some homework. <laughs> Today, we don't have a chance to do any homework. <clears throat> Because we wake up with a bias and we turn on Fox News or we turn on MSNBC and we are confirmed in our opinion. Or we get a tweet from a friend who agrees with us and we agree with them and we say, if he says it's true, I'm saying it's true, it's true. And then we may run to other people that we know and say, I can never count on them telling me the truth because they disagree with me or I know he's always telling me the truth because I always agree with him. And the truth is, members of Congress are just like we are. It used to be if you were upset with your congressman, you sent them a letter. And it took five days for it to get to the Capitol. It took another two or three days to be opened. It took another day for it to be summarized and sent to the congressman. And then somebody would draft a response and you'd get a response. And by the time you got your response, you weren't as angry as the day you wrote your letter. And common sense intervened, and the congressman may have said, I think we can solve this, or I think it's already been solved, or it wasn't the problem as you described it, it was something else. Today, you send a text message to your member of Congress, or an email, or a tweet, or maybe you TikTok to them. <laughs> and they see it, and they immediately want to respond, and they're predisposed to agree with you because they're paranoid about you. They want to agree with you. So they say, <clears throat> I just got your text message. You're right. I'm on it. I'm with you 100%. <clears throat> and then they do a little homework, and they find out it wasn't quite as described in my text. <clears throat> it wasn't that way. I don't think I can do this, but... Oh, I can't, I've already told him I'd do it, so I can't change my mind because the greatest problem in politics is if you become a flip-flopper. So I'm not going to flip because I would then flop. So they get stuck on stupid fast, but they're the people that are supposed to exercise judgment. <clears throat> in our democracy, we as participants of the democracy go vote. It's our vote. But we are voting people to represent us and our founding fathers, along with Aristotle and Plato, said, make sure that in a republic, the people who are representatives will actually take the time to exercise judgment. And that's so important that we want another branch to have the time to exercise, exercise wisdom and judgment. That's supposed to be the Senate. And then it goes to the president to make a decision. So we've got people stuck on stupid in the House, people stuck on stupid in the Senate, and not much happens that's not stupid. Thank you for the history lesson. Um, Get that a little closer. Oh, sorry. So in organizational behavior, they talk about span of control. Normally, in textbooks, they say you can only be effective if you have no more than eight people reporting to you directly at the same time. You two had the. You had the job of, of uh, making sure that uh, the proper people got into here, uh, be heard by the president, and so forth. Did you have regular um, appointments for each, say, cabinet person at, the, at a set time every week? And then how well did that schedule last over a period of time? The answer is no. We did not have scheduled appointments for every cabinet member every week. The cabinet members saw the president when they really needed to. So many of the questions, so many of the points they wanted to make could be made other than talking directly to the president. Andy and I would agree on 
this proposition fundamentally, and that is one of the main jobs of the chief of staff is to protect the president's time. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, there was a famous experiment carried out by Jerry Ford when he was president. Uh, it was called the spokes of the wheel. It was a model whereby all the top advisors would report directly to Jerry Ford, and it was a disaster. And um, literally, on, the, on, on his last day in the White House, Dick Cheney um, was given a present by the staff, and it was a, it was a mangled bicycle wheel <laughs> in honor of this failed experiment, commemorating it. Uh, Dick Cheney decided instead of taking it home and putting it in the garage, he would leave it for his successor, Hamilton Jordan, Jack's colleague. He left it on a, with a note that said, beware Hamilton, beware the spokes of the wheel. Dick Cheney. The chief of staff's job is to make sure the president's time is well used because he never gets it back. So, and many people want to see the president. In fact, most people want to see the president, including staffers who see him every day. We try to hang around. And I had a very strict rule. If you're appointed by the president, you're appointed by the president, and you can see him anytime you need to. You better not see him anytime you want to. And I bet many times you will come in and claim that you need to see the president, and I'm gonna scratch at you. And I bet it'll be a veneer, very thin, of need covering a giant want. And the same thing applied to cabinet members or senior White House staffers. Time is so critical and the president should use his time to be presidential, not to be a friend. And so, but yes, the chief of staff's job, there are roughly 2,500 people in theory that the chief of staff helps manage. There are 20 odd assistants, there's a caste system. Assistant to the president, deputy assistant to the president, special assistant to the president, director, associate director and deputy director caste system, and chiefs of staff need the discipline to be able to manage a staff, and the president shouldn't manage anybody other than the chief of staff. My question is for you, uh, Andy Card. Would you comment on how you feel about Trump, Liz Cheney, and if you had the choice of voting between Biden and Trump in the next election, how would you vote? I should plead the fifth. <laughs> no, no, I, candidly, I, I am not a fan of President Trump. I agreed with some of the policies that were implemented during his presidency. I did not agree with his personality or his performance or his personal vendettas that I think corrupted the nature of politics and compromise, so I'm not a Trump fan. I am a Republican. I'm called a rhino by some. No, I am a Republican, and I know what the Republican Party has stood for, and I believe that it still does stand for, and it can stand for, and I'm gonna to fight to help do that. I have great respect for Liz Cheney. I had great respect for Dick Cheney. And people think that he was a tough vice president to work with. No, he was a joy to work with because he wasn't looking to be president. And he had opinions and he wasn't afraid to express them, but he never blindsided me nor the president in doing it. But I'm very proud of Liz Cheney and what she has done. I candidly supported her at her bid for re-election. I did not expect that she would win, so I was willing not to throw my money away, but to demonstrate that I supported her. And I, I feel very strongly the two-party system is very valuable. America accidentally got into a two-party state. Our founding fathers didn't plan on parties. We kind of got there. I think the two-party system is the best way for our democracy to work, so I want two strong parties. I want a strong Democratic Party, I want a strong Republican Party. And I'm going to work to make sure people have a chance to recognize how important our democracy is and that it is a republic, thankfully not a direct <clears throat> democracy. I do want people to exercise judgment, judgment and wisdom, and then allow the president to make a decision. I will be actively engaged in the campaigns this year. 
I will be supporting Republicans. I, if President Trump is the nominee of the party, I would have a hard time voting for him. Could I ask a follow-up to that, just a brief follow-up to that, and that is, how old is too old for a president to run for re-election? I've, I've said this publicly, so I'm not afraid to say it here. I'm 75 years old. I have lapses of memory sometimes that are inexcusable. I see a friend and I say, what's their name, what's their name? I don't like those lapses when they show up and I frequently get over them, but I'm convinced at 75, it's important to acknowledge that you get them every once in a while. I personally, we have an age limit in the Constitution as when, to, when you can become a congressman, a senator, or a president. I don't think it would be wrong for us to have a constitutional amendment to say you cannot take the oath of office after your 75th birthday. Jack, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> Age uh, is such an individual thing. We, I could give you the names of dozens of people, Felix Frankfurter, Louis Brandeis, justices of the United States Supreme Court, John Marshall Harlan, the original John Marshall, who was 87. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was 87. Age is so individual. I am in favor, not of a constitutional amendment that prescribes when a person, a man or a woman, who happens to become 75. I'm 83. And his brain works really well. <laughs> <laughs> We've noticed. And, but I, I do. I, I want the voters to decide. Everybody's watching Joe Biden every day. You have an opportunity to see him on television, to hear him on the radio, to see him doing live press conferences. Every American who wants to spend the attention and the time to watch the president and to make a judgment about whether or not he's too old can go to the polls and say so. We've also got the 25th Amendment. 25th Amendment is a, gap, is a stop gap measure, which if a president does appear not to be able to perform the duties of his or her office, there, are, there is a process, a procedure, by which that can be remedied, both in the cabinet and <coughs> or in the Congress. So we have a stop gap measure there, which we passed for this very reason. But I favor letting the people decide rather than the calendar. My question is, uh, it's easy to say, go out and vote. But the problem is, why is the Republican congressional uh, people at the state and national level doing everything in, their possi uh, in everything possible to prevent people from voting? In, in my opinion, <laughs> I'll, I'll, that's a subject, sir, that requires thoughtful and extensive discussion. And we don't have time for that, so I'll just tell you, at the bottom of it all, the right to vote and the ease with which people can go to the polls and vote, no matter what their condition, no matter whether they're rich or poor, no matter whether they're healthy or not, making it easy for people to exercise their right to vote is one of the most important things we can do in this country. And, and those who would do things, who would pass laws which run against that principle are running against the democracy that we hold so dear. It's one of the, I believe that the right to vote and the protection of the right to vote in this country are two of the most important subjects that we can address right now, bar none. I'll just add. I, I, I'll say on that, we have an obligation to make sure people know they can register to vote and to help them. If you're here, chances are you vote. The chances are you also know people who don't. It's incumbent on us to be contagious with the 
opportunity to vote. So my grandmother was a militant suffragette, born in 1894. She was a practicing suffragette, marching, protesting. She got the right to vote in August of 1920. She told me the most important word in the Constitution was the first word, we. When I was your age, we didn't apply to me. It wasn't my government because I didn't have the right to vote. The right to vote is there now. Register to vote, vote, have the courage to run for office, speak up, get involved. She convicted me when I was in high school to be ready and eager to vote and to be able to say, yes, I want to serve. So please be contagious. I, I just want to add to that before we take the next question. Who's been to one of our new series, Conversations on Contentious Issues? Anybody? Supreme Court Immigration? Our first program, first week of February, it's on this topic. Put it on your calendars. I just want to go back in history a little bit because this has bugged me ever since it happened. Um, when H.W. kicked uh, Saddam out of Kuwait, he chose not to have regime change. W., on the other hand, had some bad information. I'd like to hear more about the bad information. And he did practice regime, regime change. So my question is, how did they get it so wrong? I was serving as Deputy White House Chief of Staff and then Secretary of Transportation under George H.W. Bush. Uh, he built, a, at the time, a, the largest coalition ever to make sure that Saddam Hussein got out of Kuwait. And part of building that coalition, which was a lot of hard work by the best foreign policy team ever in the presidency, his, his foreign policy was remarkable. They built a huge coalition to meet an obligation to kick Saddam Hussein and Iraq out of Kuwait. They accomplished that mission. And yes, there were temptations to extend the mission to say, go to Baghdad. President Bush, in my opinion, was appropriately restrained in making a decision to do that because he had promised potential allies who ended up being very significant in that effort. They should have had a chance to say, how would they feel about that or not? And since he had served in the United Nations and been an active vice president traveling around the world helping Ronald Reagan, he knew how important it was to keep your word with leaders of other countries who are allies. And he gave his word that it was just Kuwait. He kept the word. And things worked out well. The UN put in tremendous obligations on Iraq. Saddam Hussein just ignored all of those, and George W. Bush was the one that dealt with the reality of if Saddam Hussein is not complying with the UN obligations that were there when he signed the truce to stop the war in Afghanistan, I mean in, in Kuwait, then the UN should have said there's a consequence for doing it. George W. Bush with Tony Blair and others said there's got to be a consequence and you know what happened after that. So that's the deal. I, I would admit there were people in the administration that thought President George H.W. Bush should have gone to Baghdad, but he gave his word and he was always a man of his word. And so I respected that and I think it made a difference. And it actually helped to build coalitions that were very valuable to President George H.W. Bush after that in, in Kuwait but it also helped President Clinton with many of the challenges that he had in foreign policy as, as, as a result of keeping his word. Can I, can I just do a quick follow-up on that? But, but was George W. Bush wrong in the end? I, and, do you think, and do you think that he now believes that, he, that it was a mistake? Do we think George W. Bush? Yes. Uh, Two-part question. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, I don't think George H. W. Bush felt it was wrong. George W. Bush... Look, at, I was Velcroed to him. I read all of the same intelligence he was reading. I had, we had remarkable conversations. And the intelligence was not as good as it should have been. And I, I do think the consequence of the UN not forcing Saddam Hussein to comply with the obligations that he accepted when they signed the, the deal to end the war, the first Gulf War, 
I think that it was terrible that the UN did not offer consequences to Saddam Hussein, and President Bush challenged the UN. He went to the UN, gave a famous speech saying, is there a consequence to violating all the rules that you put in place? And Saddam Hussein kept violating them and violating and violating them. And I think he felt that the obligation was to go in. And with a large coalition, people tend to forget that it was a very large coalition, he went into Iraq. Our intelligence on our side was not good. Even our intelligence on how to conduct the war was not that good, in my opinion. So we made some missteps. But I think George W. Bush kind of wishes he didn't go in the way he went in, but he will never do anything to diminish the sacrifices that were made because he needed help keeping his oath of office. And so you'll, you find there is no one in America who is more supportive of people who answer the call to duty because of a presidential need than a president. They are always grateful for those young men and women who make sacrifices that they would never invite on anybody. And even when you leave the presidency, that burden does not leave you. President Bush is the personification of gratitude for service to this nation. And he's gonna to continue to be there. So he will never diminish the need that he needed at the time for Americans to step up and help and go and make sacrifices that he wouldn't want to invite on anybody. It's a terrible burden for a president to carry, but it's an even greater burden for the families of those who made sacrifices. And we should respect that. A wise man has said and believes that he's not entitled to an opinion unless he can argue the other side equally or better than his opponent. So gentlemen, my challenge to you is what is your best argument on why the opposing party of yours will win the November elections? I'll go first. We're in dire straits. You know, I, we are in dire straits. We've got tens of millions of people who will not accept the legitimacy of, of the 2020 election. And that is, that can be, that has the potential to be fatal to a, to a functioning democracy. I don't think that we should be voting for people who take that position. Some 48, 50, 52, 54 federal courts across the land with, with judges, both district court judges and appellate court judges appointed by both Republicans and Democrats looked at the allegations and the, and the so-called evidence of any illegitimacy or fraud in the 20, 2020 election and rejected it unanimously. For us in the approaching the end of 2022, to still have a lot of people in the country taking the opposite position and ignoring the facts is a very dangerous thing. It gave rise to an insurrection on the capital of the United States on January 6th of last year. What could be more serious than that? What deserves what deserves the condemnation of the people, all the people, Democrats and Republicans and independents, young and old, sick and well, than a condemnation of an assault on the capital of the United States to prevent the counting of the legitimate votes for president? I don't know. That's why I think we should vote Democrat. I already stated out, I think the job of a chief of staff is to have the courage to speak truth to power. And sometimes what you're given for information isn't as truthful as you would like it, and that's a challenge for a chief of staff. So they have to scratch and try to make sure that they are, in fact, telling the truth. January 6th, I, I wept. I would encourage all of you to read the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. 
please read it. And I think that you should hold that 14th Amendment up and challenge those who are running for office if they believe it, if they can respect it. But it's important for us not to throw away our democracy. It's to get involved and to make it work. And we have to give permission for people to say stupid things and invite them to acknowledge that they're stupid. One of, one of the provisions that Andy's referring to in the 14th Amendment is that anybody who participated in an insurrection against the United States government can't hold office. Period. <clears throat> can, I, can, so, I, can, I, can I just ask on that? How would that, we've seen it applied already in New Mexico. One, one case in, in New Mexico. One case in New Mexico where an office holder has been removed from office on, on that basis. How would this apply to a presidential candidate? How would I, it be I don't enforced? know. It, the, the good news is I'm an engineer, not a lawyer. <laughs> Jack is a lawyer. I, I did not know. <laughs> I did not know that if you were an engineer and a politician, you were an oxymoron. <laughs> so I don't know whether I'm the moron or the oxy. But that 14th <clears throat> Amendment to me is serious. January 6th was serious. I don't know that the, what the judge decided in Arizona will stand up to great scrutiny. New Mexico. New Mexico. And I don't know <clears throat> what, I know that the obligation primarily from my understanding falls on Congress. Congress would have the right to say, there was a participation in an insurrection, you participated, you were no longer eligible to hold office. So I don't think Congress would have a vote to convict anybody of that but I think Congress should be challenged to find a guilty, guilty conscience as to why they won't do it. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, you both had the privilege of serving two of our most honored and cherished one-term presidents. Uh, what would your advice be to Joe Biden, should he choose to run again, as to how to avoid being a one-term president? Joe, Joe, I don't, th I don't Joe, think I don't think Joe is taking advice from Andy. <laughs> George, George H. Uh, no, seriously, George H. W. Bush is a relatively unique president in in that he had the highest approval rating and the lowest approval rating of a president, sitting president. He had the highest approval rating at the end of the first Gulf War, which ended the Vietnam syndrome in this country when we celebrated a victory and troops marched down Pennsylvania Avenue and his approval ratings were over 90%. And then he had the challenges that came in the end of his term and a, a, and Ross, a, challenge, Perot. a Ross Perot, a challenge from an independent car, party and he ended up in very low approval ratings and he didn't win re-election. It pained us. But the strength of the character of George H.W. Bush, who was my favorite person that I met in politics, was that he was a gentleman. Yes, he and he respected our institutions. He particularly in, in, respected the institution of democracy and the will of the people. And he, was, he did not want to lose. And he was very depressed when he did. And he was probably even a little bit angry. But I received a phone call and he invited me to run his transition out of government. And he said, I want to run this transition so that President Clinton, when he comes in, will truly be ready to do the job on day one. So I want you to make sure that he gets all the help he needs to be prepared. <clears throat> 